A call came in at 1132 a.m. A woman, mid-30s, had just disappeared from her job. The caller was her co-worker, a man, and I ain't using no names, who sounded more confused than worried. And he said she was there one minute and then she was gone the next. No signs of a struggle, no unusual behavior prior to the disappearance. Just a, a disappearance, I mean, just a regular day at the office until it wasn't. And um, I got to the scene by like noon. And the office was one of those like open space designs, you know, desks scattered around and everything. And her desk was neat. It was almost like, uh, like she had a, uh, uh, AD, you know, not ADD, but you know that compulsive thing where you gotta have everything perfect. Every paper was lined up, square, pens and pencils was right where your hands would grab them. You know, her computer was on sleep mode, and she had half a cup of coffee, growing cold about a second, sitting on the desk, and her coat was still hanging on the chair, and it was a real nice coat too, looked like some designer stuff. And her purse was tucked away and a big drawer down at the bottom. Again, nice design of purse. And it looked like she just stepped out for a minute. You know, like maybe she went back to the bathroom or went to go take a personal call or something. And I interviewed her co-workers, but nobody saw anything and no one heard anything. It was like she just evaporated in the thin air. I checked the security footage and she was there, sitting at her desk. And then, like, it was like a, the cameras just went out, <laughs> like, um, you know, like a glitch in the system or whatever. And they said that this is something that they would have, you know, because at this time, um, you know, CCTV was something, you know, that was kind of, you know, it's kind of getting more to the masses, you know, so, so problems with um, the cameras, you know, it wasn't just something unheard of but for whatever reason the cameras went out for an um, extended period of time and by the time the cameras was back she was gone and there was no signs of her leaving the building nobody reported any weird calls or any weird strangers hanging around no trucks or vans with the windows blacked out you know nothing nothing was out the ordinary Except her disappearing. And the office was busy. It was busy enough to where, you know, um, you could get lost in the sauce and people not watching your every move. But it wasn't so big that, you know, if I asked about it, people was like, who? You know, they all knew who she was. Now, the rest of the day was spent you know, with just all kind of activity going on, talking to the friends in the office. You know, there was a few people she was close to, but she seemed to be kind of private for the most part. She didn't have any family, but everybody said the same thing. She was normal, happy, no signs of distress, no reason to run. Yet here we are trying to figure out where she went. Now, this is a small town, and usually I know a case like this, you know, in a bigger city, they just say, hey, you know, the lady left, she got her right to privacy, but this is the type of town where, just quite honestly, nobody got anything going on except for work and their basic home life. So when anything happened, just, I'm talking about anything that can't be explained, people quickly just get, you know, real curious on the, on the matter, so... Even me, myself, you know, I didn't have to really investigate into this, but there was a, it's just a boredom. You know, you just get bored when you, you know, work in these little small towns and stuff like that. So it literally just gave me something to do. And uh, as the day, you know, got to nighttime, I found myself back at her desk staring at that cup of coffee and the office was quiet. The hustle and bustle of the day was gone and I couldn't shake just like this uneasy feeling I had. You know, uh, something was off. 
you know, something was way off. The question was, what was off? <laughs> um, and that's what haunted me. And um, I felt like I was missing a piece of the puzzle. You know, just a piece of, one little piece, you know, just make this whole thing go away. And, um, you know, that night, it messed with me. And I done seen some things. But I guess when you can't, it ain't the, 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 the it ain't that, that real violent stuff that mess with you. You know, it's the stuff that you can't explain that mess with you. You know, because your brain want to make a reason out of stuff. It want to, it want to come up with why this happened and how it happened. Now, one month, nothing much going on, you know, the next day, so I was able to kind of take a little second look at this, and uh, I just took a moment to, like, reflect on the dynamics of her workplace. Now, she was the only black woman in the office that was dominated by older white men, and the hierarchy was um, clear. The older men at the top, younger men beneath them, oftentimes they sons or nephews or something like that, and the older women working under the younger men. And the older men seemed to have a preference for hiring younger, attractive women. And it was a pattern that didn't escape notice. The older women in the office who had spent many years climbing the corporate ladder found themselves reporting to men who were their juniors. And uh, you can see like the, the bitterness that they had because of that. And then having to deal with the younger women who they felt weren't qualified for the job, but, you know, got it anyway. Trying to teach them the ropes and show them, and, you know, those women couldn't care. They was just there to get a check. But I miss a lady. She stood out not just because of her race, but also because of her competence. She was good at her job, and she often outperformed her peers. But her success was like, um, you know, kind of overshadowed by the hiring, pro you know, practices. So, you know, she was, I think it seemed like she knew what was going on. So she went up like above and beyond to try to show that she was more than just a pretty face. So the office has had all these biases, ageism, sexism, racism, you know, even interwoven into a little bit. And uh, just all in this big quilt, you know, at this workplace. And it was a toxic environment, you know, and uh, one that could take a toll on somebody mentally. But it wasn't as bad as, you know, you know, it ain't like people getting cussed out and stuff every day. But, you know, for a person with the wrong uh, upbringing that wasn't, you know, given what they need to be able to uh, withstand the pressures of life, I could see it getting to him, you know? And when I was younger, I didn't, but as I get older, you know, I kind of see how the, the pressures of life can wear down on some people, you know? Not saying that their actions justified afterwards, but hey, you know? But I can't help but wonder if the office dynamics play a role in her disappearance. You know, it had to factor some kind of way. But, you know. I had to break down the office staff piece by piece, person by person. And the older white man, which I, you know, coined the senior management. I had to approach this group with a formal and respectful demeanor. Acknowledging their position in the company. You know, the questions would be direct and focused on their professional interactions with the missing woman. And um, I would also have to probe into their hiring you know, practices. And just so subtly question the pattern of hiring younger, attractive women. And, uh, but, you know, at the same time, I had to maintain a non-accusatory tone to keep them cooperative. But I know a lot of times, once you... Depending on how you talk, man, you know, men is men, so just come at it the right way and you probably get them to, you know, open up a lot about what they think about the young women who work there. And the younger men, 
the young white men who I term coined uh, middle management, the detective, uh, to get some out of them would have to adopt a more like casual approach with this group and make them feel comfortable. And the questions will revolve around their daily interactions with the missing women and their observations about their behavior and state of mind. And I would also have to ask about their relationship with senior management and their opinion about the hiring practices. Now, a lot of these men are um, hot-blooded, want to prove themselves, and uh, but at the same time, haven't learned to master their vices yet. So. If I can just, you know, get them, just get them talking, they'll open up. Because the guilt, it already be weighing heavy on them. They haven't learned how to deal with it yet. Now, the older women who are calling their subordinates, I would have to approach this group with empathy, acknowledging their potential feelings of resentment due to the office dynamics. And the questions will focus on their personal interactions with the Mr. Woman and their perspective on the office environment. I would also try to understand their feelings about the younger woman being hired and how it affected their work and morale. And this group was really ready to open up because they already felt like they weren't being heard. So it didn't take much for them to open up and you know, give me every piece of dirt I ever thought I would need, you know. Now the younger women, the new hires, I had to be supportive and non-intimidating with this group. As they already might feel vulnerable, you know, knowing that they new to the company and already not sure of they self. You know, some of them even truthful enough with they self to know why they got the job. But the questions will be about their experience in the company. Their interactions with the missing woman and any unusual incidents or behaviors they notice. And I also will try to understand their perspective on being hired, you know, potentially for their looks and how it affected their, you know, professional interactions. Now, techniques I will use is strategic disclosure, is uh, and mirroring and feign ignorance. False flag and uh, good old good cop, bad cop routine. So strategic dis disclosure. Yeah, this involves revealing some information to the person you're interviewing to make them feel more comfortable sharing their own information. And this could be some small or unrelated to the case, but it, you know, it create like a sense of um, reciprocity. You know, it's like you did, you scratch my back, I scratch your back type thing. And then mirroring is a mirroring is a psychological technique where the interviewer subtly like mimics the interviewee's body language, their speech patterns and attitudes, and this can help build rapport and make the interview uh, person you're interviewing more open to sharing information. Um, you got feigned ignorance. This is where you pretend to know less about the case than they actually do. And this can encourage the person to correct your misunderstandings by giving you more information. Then it's the false flag, which in some cases, the interviewer might pretend to share the same beliefs as the person they're interviewing or attitude to gain their trust. And, you know, but you got to be careful because, um, <laughs> You know, that's one you gotta be careful with because a lot of times people don't even know what they believe they self. Then um, the good cop, bad cop, you know, just the classic technique involves, uh, you know, the two opposing attitudes, you know, one person being all sympathetic and understanding and the other person being real harsh and throwing out accusations. And, uh, you know, just to make them go with the one that's more understanding and feel like they you know, understand them a little bit or whatever, and they open up with them. So the older white men, I felt like the strategic disclosure and feign ignorance could be effective with this group. So, you know, I figure if I could strategically reveal some information, then I could create a sense of like camaraderie uh, and feel like we on a shared understanding. And if I just feigned a little ignorance and about certain aspects of the case, it might make them share information to correct my understanding. And the one thing about old folks is, um, you know, 
especially old white folks you got an old white man you got to let his you know you can't hurt his ego you know let his ego roll and he not going you know that he ain't going to let somebody young and you know especially from another you know, <laughs> you know. so hey you got to let him uh, let him think that he running things you know give him just enough but make it put a little twinge in there just messed up Cause his nat- natural inclinations is to try to fix it, cause that's what they do in business. You know, they've been in this business working and fixing problems and all that. So when you give him a problem to solve, he'll solve it for you. Now for the younger guys, I use mirroring, mirroring, cause it's effective with this group because I'm mimicking their speech and body language, and. It's helped me build a rapport with them and make them feel more comfortable. And then the good cop, bad cop technique could also be used. And um, but you got to be careful though, you know. Just with the young guys, they kind of, you know, they they kind of, they and some of them might be a little nervous with talking to cops. And then some of them, like I said, feeling guilty. So it don't take much, but you might have to give them a little push. To go ahead and get them where you want them at. Now the older women, it's just pure empathy, you know. That's all it takes. Uh, that strategic disclosure and uh, sharing some information with them can make them feel comfortable with opening up, letting them know about times when I've been scared or nervous or times when I felt like I was being treated unfairly, whatever it took. And that stuff will get them to open up easy. And the young women... That's where you got to create a supportive and non-intimidating environment. Like uh, strategic disclosure and feign ignorance could help and make them feel comfortable and encouraging them to share their experiences. But um, it's all about personal, you know, and it's about being harmless, you know, creating a sense of trust. And no, and I need to let. I gotta feel like I need your help, babe. Uh, like I, I need your help. I don't. I got this information wrong. I might give them a little fake information, just to get them to correct it. You know, and I just fill them out. But they don't want to help. It's once I get to pulling on them heartstrings. But in this case here, you know, I had to be careful because there was so much emotion involved. I didn't, you know, you gotta watch people, man. People is people, something else. They lie to you. They lie to hurt other people. So I had to watch um, what information I took and how I took it and how I got it because I didn't need anybody, you know, misleading me, especially with a case that was such a head scratcher. Now, the first, I guess, lead or clue in this case was the janitor found a notebook on the roof of the building and it was hers like no doubt about it the handwriting matched uh the samples that we had from her but what was inside the notebook it was you know i never seen nothing like it the notebook was filled with frantic scribbles uh, notes about the devil coming for her it was uh, just contrasted the woman that everybody described. They said she was normal, you know, happy, never showed signs of distress, real cool under pressure. But these notes showed a picture of a woman just living in fear. And uh, a woman who was just sure that something bad was coming to her. And I spent the day going over these notes and it was pictures of the devil. It just pictures was drawn like, you know, one of those shabby drawings, man. They it was just, you know, real detailed. And each one was different. But, you know, and, uh, man, you know, I thought maybe she's an artist. But it wasn't no art anywhere else on her desk. Somebody this good at art would probably keep something around on the table maybe but she didn't seem to be an artist from my analyzations of her she seemed to be more of a, a, a logistical side brain person not too much into the artsy type of stuff you know but uh, I could have been wrong but you know that science is usually never wrong but um 
I was trying to decipher the ramblings and I was thinking it must be some kind of metaphor. So was she in trouble or was it somebody after her and she called this person a devil or was it a like a psychological issue manifesting? And the notes say it dates on them. And the earliest one was from a month ago and the latest one from the day she disappeared. And it seemed like the fear was getting higher and higher over time and the notes became like more desperate. You can just feel the desperation and this isn't right. You know, it's like you could feel the pain, like you just felt sorry for her. And I spent the day going over the notes trying to, you know, just... <laughs> but it was a good breakthrough though. But it also made the mystery even crazier. Now, why didn't she tell anybody about this? Why did she leave the notebook on the roof? You know, was she, that means she must have been on the roof. But to get to the roof, you had to climb the ladder. And uh, from what everyone says, she was kind of a girly girl. And to climb this ladder, you had to uh, and take a ladder to get up to let the ladder down. So most people just don't see her going through all that. And plus, there was you know they reported that the ladder was still up in its up position. You know it wasn't like it. They found it let down. So that kind of killed that narrative. So in this case, the psychology of the co-workers can be uh, complex and multifaceted. So the co-workers initially go through shock and disbelief. And uh, the co-workers will likely experience, you know, just this sudden shock and, and just feeling that all this can't be real because of the disappearance of their colleague, especially in such mysterious circumstances. And... Uh, this could lead to denial or difficulty accepting the reality of the situation. And then after that comes the fear and anxiety and the discovery of the notebook and its disturbing contents could you know, like put this fear and anxiety in the coworkers. And they might start to worry about their own safety, especially if they start to believe that the devil mentioned in the notebook could be a real threat. Now for the time being, we was keeping the devil under wraps but, um, you know, because, yeah, the, it, it, the book seemed like she was talking about the devil himself, like Lucifer. But it could have just been a, a, a boyfriend that was going crazy over her. Or maybe a boyfriend that she cheated on and, and he's coming back for revenge. Like... You know, it's just so many possibilities, man. So, why, you know, but she must have personally known the guy, right? To call him the devil. He couldn't be a, he couldn't be a, a stranger. A stranger, you wouldn't know enough about him to call him the devil. It would have to be something that you seen when you looked up in his eyes. And something when you felt the cold touch of his hands or, you know, around your throat. It gotta be something that you've seen in him will, will make you call him the devil. And it was guilt. Now, her co-workers might feel guilt after that and, uh, especially if they notice changes in the missing woman behavior and then act on it. And they might replay interactions in their minds and wonder if they could have done something to uh, prevent the disappearance. You know, and uh, you find as people's stories change. So now, yeah, they say they can't figure anything out. But, you know, you you interview people again and you get a whole different story sometime. And it's not even because they purposely lie. And it's just, you know, one of the weaknesses of the human brain. And now they probably would get towards suspicion. You know, and it, it, it should be a pretty tense environment. And uh, co-workers might start to suspect each other, especially if they believe, uh, you know, if we release this devil information and they start to think that it might be one of them. 
It seemed like the woman didn't deal with too many people. We had, you know, having a hard time tracking down anybody that dealt with her after work. It almost seemed like her co-workers was her only people she ever interacted with, on at least on a consistent basis. And, uh, and again, that's how people turn on each other. You know, it's all good. And it just takes something, one little thing. And this in case situation, not a little thing, but when when a major life event happens, it can cause people to turn on each other quick, fast, and in a hurry. And you can't guess who gonna turn on who, and you can't guess, you know, how it's just it just happens. Just snap. And all of a sudden you got people telling on their best friends. And then it's not even because they have facts. Just part of the human psyche. After the suspicion come the empathy. Some co-workers might feel empathy for the missing woman and try to understand her fear and anxiety that uh, was expressed in a notebook and leading to feelings of sadness and concern. A lot of them may go into deep, deep depressions, man, that could last, you know, months, maybe even years. And uh, they'll come out of it. Some of them, and when they come out, here comes the curiosity. This is when the police have tried all they can try, and you know, now they start poking around their cells, looking for clues, looking for patterns, checking out their coworkers. Now, this isn't every, now everybody ain't finna do that. You know, I'm not saying they all gonna be a bunch of the whole place gonna be a big Scooby Doo Mr. Ink, but there'd be somebody, maybe one or two, that just, you know, feel like they have to do something about this. And after they all do something, after they all go through their depression, after they all go through their curiosity stage, or the few who choose to, there comes the normalization. Now, over time, they start to get back into their everyday lives. And this is a psychological defense mechanism that helps individuals cope with extraordinary situations. And they might try to focus on their work and maintain the routine to regain some type of normalcy. And again, for some of them, it'll work. But some of them might be stuck back in fear and anxiety or shock and disbelief. Everybody different. Now, the psychology of the police in such a case can be very, very, very complex. So, we got the professionalism. Police officers are trained to maintain professionalism in all situations. And this means they would approach the case objectively and focus on the facts and evidence rather than letting emotions influence their judgment. And then there's a level of dedication that the police would have into solving the case. And they understand the gravity of the situation and impact on a missing woman to the co-workers and even the community as a whole. And this dedication often translates in long hours and meticulous examination of evidence and relentless pursuit of leads. And then comes the frustration. And in a case where leads are scarce and the situation is just as stunning as a sudden disappearance, it's natural for the police to experience frustration. Now, however, they try to manage these feelings and not let them affect their work. And I can tell you from personal experience, easier said than done. But we do have critical thinking techniques. And, uh, in this case, they would, we would need to like piece together the evidence and make connections and form hypotheses about what could have happened. They involve uh, like a high level analytical thinking and problem solving skills. And this is kind of like the, the X factor that you have as a policeman, especially as a detective. You know, many people can watch somebody tell a story and they can see a woman crying and 
And uh, she just spilling her guts out about how bad her boyfriend mistreated her. But as a cop, you know, we taught to put aside the tears, put aside her being a female, and search for the facts. Because the emotions are liars. I done seen more women than I can remember crying their eyes out. Telling us about how bad their boyfriend or husband was. But in reality, she was the one who was uh, crazy. And he was laying upstairs in the bedroom, sleeping peacefully except for the, the holes in his body. As a police officer, um, we do have to have empathy, though. You know, we got to maintain that professionalism, but we got to be empathetic. We got to understand that people involved are going through a tough time and would handle, um, and we got to handle our interactions with them sensitively. You know, so, yeah, I'm not going to get swayed by your tears, but if you're a victim, you know, I, I understand that you're a victim. Now, when I first get there, I may be a little rough just to, uh, just to make sure that the, the scene is safe. But once it's established on what's going on, you know, it is important that I be understanding. But it's only so much you can go, and eventually officers will become stressed. And uh, especially with cases of disappearances, because they can be just so stressful, especially when it's uh, public and media pressure to solve the case. And police officers are trying to handle the stress, but, you know, it can still affect your uh, psychology. People asking you those tough questions and making it feel, making you feel like you, you know, not trying or, uh, you know, incapable. It's not a good feeling. But we have a determination, and despite the challenges, we're determined to solve the case. And each unsolved case is a reminder of the importance of our work and a strength in our resolve to bring justice and closure. Now, I had to do a background check on this lady. So that's the personal details, I had to verify that and verify, you know, a name, a date of birth, social security number, and, uh, you know, just the basics and make sure you got the right person. And uh, then the address history, check the person on uh, wherever where they live, and uh, through public records or credit report information. And um, in this case, the address on file didn't exist. And that was a, you know, a major red flag. She had been working at this place for years, but nobody, um, like, <laughs> you know, when they sent out W-2s, just they say this is where they sent it. So she had been having, you know, her information sent to an address that don't exist. We check criminal records, and um, it's usually can be done through your online databases and local court records, and some states or countries may have different laws about accessing this information, but of course for a cop, you know, we get this information and when you, when you get pulled over for, a, you know, a traffic infraction, uh, credit history, you know, checking for, you know, if uh, maybe see if she was in trouble, if she owed anybody a crazy amount of money or anything like that. And employment verification, checking all her past employment talking to previous employers, uh, seeing, you know, was, did she maybe get into trouble? You know, because the main thing, what we're trying to see is bad moves she made. Did she have any enemies? You know, is there anybody that she done ticked off somewhere? That's the kind of stuff we're looking for. Is there anybody she owes substantial amount of money to? Does she have any court cases on her? You know, all these type of, is there, does she have a read? Maybe she got... Uh, court hearing that she didn't go to and now she ready to run or um, you know maybe she robbed a bank and she saw on the news that they got some new evidence in the case so it's just a lot you have to consider you know you gotta consider a lot 
And I hate to say it, but until we prove that she not, she's really like a suspect in her own disappearance. And we, we even went as far back as to education, confirm her educational background and schools and attended and degrees earned. And, uh, con- and uh, we had to do reference checks, contact the, the personal and professional references that she had to see the character, if she had anybody that would, you know, uh, stand up and say, yeah, she's a good person or no, she's not. We had to check online for our Facebook, TikToks and those type of things. And, uh, you know, get an idea of what might be going on. You see a lot of people, you know, I've had people come up, you know, uh, uh, hard, severely hard. And uh, we'll go check their Facebook page or Instagram and we'll see, you know, kind of pictures or comments or posts where they arguing with people. Telling people when I see you, it's on site and the person telling them vice versa. So... They ended up seeing each other. So a lot of times, you know, social media can be a huge uh, helper in a lot of these cases. It it actually blows my mind the amount of dirt that people do live on social media. You know, Um, her driving records, we check that. Um, You know, verify her license and uh, any type of license she may have. So I had to put together a full profile of this lady's history. I had to know everything about her history because that's what helps the clues make sense. You know, when you put the pieces together, you have to know about the person. And the more you know about that person, the more something that may have not even been a clue turns to a clue. The only problem was this background check on this lady didn't turn up anything. We found out that the company didn't do much of a check on her because the company hired people or women for their good looks. So there was never a thorough check on this lady. It was never... You know, they they didn't verify her past employment. They didn't verify her education. They didn't even check to see if she had a degree. They didn't check to see even if her license (laughs) was legit. So, this woman has basically slipped through the cracks. Now, wow. This isn't the smartest way to hire people. Like, it's not against the law. So, it just meant that my job would be a lot harder. But even after searching through her personal belongings, which was not immediately done, because she still had to be, you know, verified as a missing person. Just literally out of my boredom, I was able to kind of you know, do a couple of things that, you know, I probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to do in another case, but, you know, it was um becoming like an obsession of mine. Now, the company did, uh, gave us the permission to look through her computer. And that was a good sign, because a lot of times companies... You know, you might have to fight them a little bit on this because um, they may not want you knowing all their secrets, but they seem genuinely upset about her, you know, missing. So they gave us access to her work computer because we didn't have much else. We realized that she didn't even, um, that uh, she had a car. Guess what? The car was a rental. It, you know, it was a rental. <laughs> so, the lady had been paying rental car fees. I don't understand this lady. I don't understand her. So, it gotta be something in her background for her to move like that. We still hadn't found out where this lady lived. 
and from from what her co-workers were saying, there's no way she could have been living in her car because she was just way too well-dressed, way too well put together to have been living in her car. But um, after checking her work computer, we found deleted videos on her work computer as well as a laptop of her own personal laptop. And it was filled with like disturbing demonic imagery. And the videos were uh, fragmented and disjointed. And it was like somebody tried to permanently erase them. But you know, our tech team pretty good at what they do and they managed to recover them. See, most people don't know that when you delete something from a computer, it's not deleted. Because the way it works is it, it removes it but then it's still stored on the on the hard drive, and over time, that stuff that's still deeply stored on the hard drive will be removed. You know, it's just because the more you delete stuff and the more you add stuff, because it's only still so much the hard drive can can carry. So it will knock those things off eventually, but it may take months before it's truly uh, deleted. And it's always a little trace. It just always seemed to be one little trace left somewhere. But um, these videos were, um, man, they show dark figures and symbols. And the symbols like often associated with like demonic entities and strange and chanting that you can't that you couldn't decipher but it sounded like it was saying something and this ain't the lady who the co-workers been describing and we've been trying to understand but you know it's, 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 man, it's getting harder and harder is she into this stuff why else would it be on her work computer? She must. This discovery raised more questions than it did answers. Everything I found brought more questions. I had nothing that, not one piece of the, the puzzle that I've been given has actually helped me solve it. It's like every piece of the puzzle makes me realize the puzzle is even bigger than I thought it was. Was she involved in some kind of cult? Was she like under the influence of somebody or something? You gotta be kinda, if she enjoyed this, if she did this for fun, then she had to be, like something really had to be going on in there. Or was this her own descent into fear and paranoia? Like the notebook suggests, maybe. <sighs> they, nobody said she seemed to be on drugs. Nobody said she sent the drink. So, when people do that kind of stuff, they're signs. It's science. You can't do hard, heavy drugs or alcohol. And yeah, you can function, but you know, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna be some sight there. It's gonna be some habit that you have uh, disappearing uh, for an hour extra before after lunch. Uh, it's gonna be you know coming to work late, uh, trying to leave early, like. It's gonna be something there that where people say, man, you know, that's just my experience. Now, a lot of things we can hide, but that's one that's really hard to hide. Now, the videos didn't provide any clear answer, but they do offer a glimpse into her state of mind. And it's clear that she was dealing with something far beyond ordinary comprehension. And I feel scared 
And this case is taking a dark turn. And I can only hope that we find her soon. Uh, I, it's almost like I need to find her for my own sanity.